Uh, we're privileged today to have two committee chairs with us from the state capitol. Um, I did serve with both of those gentlemen uh, while I was in the House of Representatives. Uh, just allow me a brief introduction uh, of them both. Uh, the first person is State Representative Gary Howell. He's from the 80, 82nd District, which is in Lapeer County. Uh, he was elected to the Michigan House of Representatives in a special election in March of 2016 and has been reelected three times uh, to, to uh, three full year, two, three full year terms, three full two year terms. There we go. Uh, since 2017, he served as chairman of the House Committee on Natural Resources and Outdoor Recreation. Uh, he's also a member of the House Committees on Workforce, Trades and Talent, Transportation and Local Government and Municipal Finance. Uh, Gary was raised on a farm near Swartz Creek. Uh, he graduated from Michigan State University and the University of Michigan Law School. He served for 40 years as a municipal attorney, representing the majority of townships and villages in Lapeer, Sanilac, and Tuscola counties. He's also a lifelong farmer. Uh, he and his wife, Cheryl, live on their farm in North Branch. Uh, they have three children, five grandchildren, and along with their son, John, they own and operate Howell Farms Limited. Uh, Gary's a U.S. veteran. He's a life member of both the American Legion and VFW. Um, he has a lot of local government experience, which I personally uh, think is important when we send people to, to the state capitol. He previously served as chairman of the Lapeer County Road Commission, president of the Lapeer County ISD Board of Education, president of the North Branch Area School Board, president of Lapeer County Bar Association. Um, Lastly, he was uh, the recipient of the Legislative Conservationist of the Year in 2018 from both the Michigan United Conservation Clubs and Ducks Unlimited. He's also been named Legislator of the Year by Michigan Townships Association and the Michigan Municipal League. Uh, in 2019, he was honored as Legislator of the Year for the Michigan Hunting Dog Federation and Safari Club. Next, we have uh, State Senator Rick Altman. Uh, he's a veteran of the United States Army and the National Guard, 11073rd in Greenville. Uh, his professional experiences includes working as the owner of Altman Excavating. He's got a Bachelor of Science in Teaching from Grand Valley State University and has a teaching degree in both biology and Spanish. He was elected as a member of the Michigan House of Representatives in 2010 and represented the 70th District until 2016 when term limits prevented him from seeking another term. Uh, in that time, he chaired the uh, Michigan Capital Committee and was a member of the House Committees on Agriculture, Commerce, Elections and Ethics, Energy and Technology, and Families, Children, and Seniors. Uh, in 2018, he was elected to represent the 63rd, 33rd, excuse me, 33rd State Senate District, which includes the counties of Clare, Gratiot, Isabella, Macosta, and Montcalm. He currently serves as chair of the Senate Committee on Environmental Quality and is a member of the following committees, Appropriations Committee and Chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Community Health, Human Resources, Natural Resources, and Transportation and Infrastructure. He's also an active member of many organizations, including the National Life Association, Right to Life of Michigan, Six Lakes Chamber of Commerce, Montcalm County Farm Bureau, and a member of the Hope Pontius 3701 BFW Post in Lakeview. Uh, he was involved in area schools assisting with Lakeview Schools wrestling teams and as a tournament director for the Lakeview Freestyle Club. He's also on the board of directors of the Mont County Soil and Conservation District and is a member of the Austin Hunting Club in Atlanta. And he lives in Six Lakes uh, with his wife, Chris. I've asked them both to let us know uh, how they see the direction of their committees going for this legislative session. Uh, also to comment on the water use Advisory Commission white paper that was uh, published a few months ago. Um, Representative Howell just had a large package of bills that passed the uh, House of Representatives dealing with recycling. And so I'd like to ask Representative Howell to go first and tell us about that package, and then we'll get to uh, Senator Owen. Representative Howell, I thought I saw you out there somewhere. Yeah, I know you said that, and then I was looking to see if I could find yeah, them. I saw Cheryl Howell on here, so I figured he was probably on his wife's. Am I unmuted now? Ah, yes, there, there you are. are. Wonderful. Very good. Very good. 
<laughs> well, as you can probably tell, I am not Cheryl Howell. <laughs> I am stealing her computer since I'm at home on the farm in North Branch and don't have access to mine. Uh, so whatever I say that's incorrect will be Cheryl's fault. <laughs> in any case, it's a real honor to speak to the uh, Michigan Lakes and Streams Association. As Dave mentioned, uh, he and I had the pleasure of serving together in the House of Representatives, as I did with Rick Outland as well uh, during my first term. But Dave was also a member of the Natural Resources Committee, which I chair, and he was an invaluable member and an outstanding voice for lakes and streams, as well as all conservation issues. First, I want to commend the member lakes and streams association. You know, we missions of very value to passing, but you folks do the heavy lifting. It's because you volunteer your time, you bring news forward, you do research, really make it happen uh, because with citizen involvement like yours, you have a difficult time a lot of the conservation legislation passed and passing. So I deeply appreciate all your efforts. As Dave indicated, I do currently serve as chairman of the uh, Committee on Natural Resources and Outdoor Recreation. I'm my year as chairman. I've been to have that role because it's my first love and the reason I ran for the house in the first place. I've been a lifelong outdoorsman and I've been blessed to have a life where I could enjoy the lakes and streams and forests of our great state. David did mention also that we recently were successful in getting a package of bills through the House of Representatives having to do with landfills and recycling. Now, I realize your focus is lakes and streams, but I know you care deeply about water quality, and that is really a lot of what these bills are about. Um, we have the misfortune in Michigan of having a, an absurd policy, which has caused the digging of massive numbers of landfills. Consequently, we are a trash magnet for the entire Midwest and Canada. 25% of all the garbage buried in Michigan comes from the Toronto area. You can imagine it makes no economic sense to ship truckloads of garbage from Toronto across the bridge into Michigan to be dumped in our landfills. And it's because of our inappropriate public policies. This package of bills intends to change that dramatically Instead of requiring landfills and landfills only, we're going to try to reorient things to accomplish major recycling. The landfills will still be there, but hopefully used much less and be much less attractive as we reduce the capacity. Governor Snyder did us a real favor in his last couple months in office in that he got legislation passed called Renew Michigan. And in that legislation, we set aside $15 million a year solely for solid waste planning. So we've got the resources we need to give the grants to the counties to do intelligent solid waste planning, which will mandatorily include recycling planning. Hopefully this will be a benefit, not only as to where everybody lives, but also at their lake homes, if those aren't their regular residences. The money is going to be there. Uh, right now, I need help in the Senate. I've got it through the House, and I look forward to Rick Altman and his fellow senators to help me get it over the finish line so we can get rid of one of the real burdens on water quality in Michigan. Other legislation we've done in my committee has oftentimes focused on water quality maybe not so much on surface water issues that you're directly involved in as much as overall water quality, such as we adopted new stringent regulations for coal ash landfills. That's the material coming out of the power plants uh, resulting in the burning of coal for energy, which will continue apparently for some time at least, particularly toxic stuff, bad stuff. We do not want it in our waters. And so we have, imposed a number of new stringent requirements to make sure that those landfills are safe and secure and will not be leaching into the, uh, into the water table. We get lots of other miscellaneous bills. Uh, in my committee this week, we had a discussion on a bill on protecting the sturgeon and a separate bill dealing with 
bait minnows. Uh, so we cover the waterfront from the biggest fish in Michigan to the smallest fish, but it's sort of potluck. It depends on what bills are introduced and get referred to my committee. In terms of recent matters that involve directly uh, the folks in, on this Zoom program, uh, we, as you know, we've had high lake levels on the Great Lakes in particular. That's resulted in much attempted legislation and regulation to try to make sure we can deal with that. Now, it looks like we're on a downward cycle again, which is good news for many lake owners. And uh, we had to enact some legislation having to do with weight control in certain very high water areas, particularly the St. Clair River area of Michigan. And we had to deal with uh, uh, permits, making sure that homeowners could get permits on an expedited basis when they're facing uh, dramatic damage from the high water. I do have one less, less good news item I want to share with you. you. I heard you mention earlier about the Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program, which has been very useful. Uh, has been around since the Angler administration. So it's been funded partially by the state for 20 some years now. Unfortunately, the governor has zeroed that money out of her executive budget. So it remains to be seen whether we're gonna be able to get that money replaced or not. Anyway, those are some of the points of legislation in my committee. I'd be happy to respond to any questions you might have at the appropriate time. But fundamentally, if you've got issues relating to the Department of Natural Resources or EGLE, formerly DEQ, and it's a policy issue, it would come before the committee that I chair. Now, I do not handle the money. I am not chairman of the appropriations side. That is Sue Aller from the Alpena area. Uh, so she has jurisdiction over actual appropriation funds. But I do have direct uh, involvement in any policy issues involved with either of those agencies. So anyway, I don't know what your format is, whether you want me to respond to questions at this point, or whether I'll let Senator Altman speak and then we both respond, I'll, I'll leave that to you folks. Uh, thank you, Representative Hall. Why don't we, why don't we hear from uh, Senator Altman and then there's questions that uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Melissa, they're gonna appear in the chat room, are they? Or are you gonna look for hands? Well, um, I think the chat would probably be a good place uh, for now. And if we get to a point where we've, um, you know, gotten through the chat and there's some people who would like to raise their hand, um, we can we can do that as well. Okay, just one comment, and I'm, you know, I'm not completely sure, but I think when you talked about the CLMP program just a minute ago being zeroed out, I think it's zeroed out because it's now part of a Renew Michigan, a bigger program. So I think they just took it out. We got to put in a couple years running because that was the only thing we could do. But I think now it's on a more stable footing. So, so it's taken out, but it's someplace else in that very, very big budget. Um, I see uh, Senator Altman is joining us. You missed my very flowery introduction. So <laughs> maybe, maybe you didn't. Maybe you're there for all of it. But. No, I, I just got on. <laughs> Good to see you, Dave. Yep, same here. Well, thank you very much. Um, so. I asked Representative Howell if you could just give us an idea of what you think the, the issues to be addressed, the direction of, of, the, of your environmental committee uh, in the Senate for the next session. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at that Water Use Advisory Council paper. We sent that along, but might not have gotten to you in time. If you do have a comment on that, fine. If not, so be it. Uh, but if you want to you know, just kind of tell us where you see things going uh, in the Senate, uh, we'd appreciate that, and then we'll look for some questions from the uh, from the folks that are that are online with us. We got almost 100 people on the on okay. the program, so hopefully we'll have a few good questions. So, mm -hmm. thank you, Senator Robin, for being here today. Yeah. So I think we're a little different in the Senate than than Representative Howell. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Representative Howell, but you are DEQ DNR combined. That's correct. Yeah. So yeah. we're a little different in the Senate. We split that committee up and Senator McBroom is the chair of DNR, but I do sit on that. And then um, and I'm the chair of the DEQ side of it. Um, 
So some of the things that we're working on, well, something that I just, um, we just passed out of the Senate was um, a bipartisan piece of legislation. Well, it was a two bill package that goes along with the, uh, the governor's uh, great or clean water initiative. Um, and mine in particular, Senate Bill 320, I think, or 319, um, one or the other. I mean, they're 319 or 320, but, and it has to do with um, creating a re revolving fund of low interest or zero interest loans for people to um, replace their septic systems. It's something that um, is near and dear to my heart coming from the excavating world. Uh, matter of fact, last weekend, I was actually installing the septic system for somebody and my brother's finishing it today. Um, so it's something I've been a part of my whole life. And I do know that um, we have a lot of trouble with elevated levels of E. coli in our lakes, rivers, and streams. I live on Flat River. And I know that, matter of fact, the headwaters of Flat R River is my hometown of Six Lakes. And then it ends up dumping into the Grand River down by Lowell. I also represent Gratiot County, which has the Pine River, and we have extremely high E. coli levels in there. Now we've, we've done some investigation because obviously a lot of people would like to, um, the low hanging fruit, I, I guess is a good way of putting it, is that farmers are the culprit. You know, that they're doing, that when they're spreading manure on their fields um, or, or even violating and doing direct dumping, we hear a lot of allegations of that. And certainly that would be illegal. We have, we have GAMPs in place, which are generally accepted management practices um, that farmers follow. And um, they're pretty strict rules. And we, and we have um, the meat program that for farmers to demonstrate that they're actually following environmentally sound practices. But we've done investigations on the river. Uh, Alma College has, um, I think maybe Michigan State, certainly the DEQ or Eagle. Um, and what we found by and large is uh, the larger share of the E. coli is human and not animal waste. And an, eng an engineering firm that our soil conservation had contracted with to help clean up the Pine River in the Alma area had said, even if it was a 50-50 split, uh, the biggest health risk is in human waste and not in the animal waste. But they said it wasn't. It was like a if I remember right, like an 80-20 split. So we know that probably failing septic systems are, are the major culprit, whether it's they're failing and just overflowing into them, or if in the past, when the systems were failing, they just went the cheap route and run a straight pipe from their tank to, to a tributary, you know, a, a creek or a county drain that dumps into the Pine River or, or even in the Flat River because we do have elevated levels there. And so we want to clean them up. But, you know, through the years, the cost of installing septic systems has grown appreciably, almost cost prohibitive for a lot of families. Um, they're good systems. I mean, they're systems that, that, you know, the design life for systems when I started was 20 years. These systems seem like they're going to go into perpetuity because of the way they're designed, but again, that comes with a cost and and probably cost prohibitive for a lot of families that don't have access to capital. So what we wanna do is implement a loan interest or zero interest loan program that people can access through a community lender. And it's modeled after um, a program out in, I wanna say Oregon, but somewhere out West. And that's, that's had good success, so. That's what we're looking at. We passed that out of the House or out of the Senate last week. Um, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Um, part of that money also can go to municipalities for fixing um, municipal wastewater systems. So because we know that in the past, you know, like now I think Grand Rapids has, has fixed theirs, but it seems like every time it rained heavily, <laughs> Grand Rapids was dumping directly into the Grand River. So we're trying to get rid of all those, those problems too. Now that those will be grants because what'll happen there is they need that money just to access the loans from the federal government. So it's a little different design with that. But that's what we're working on. Uh, an, another area right now that we will be um, uh, 
uh, focusing on in, in the DEQ committee is um, has to do with the Edenville Dam failure last year. We had held uh, several fact-finding hearings in my committee last year. We brought in DNR, Eagle, FERC, other entities associated with the dam. Um, and the state also convened a dam safety task force to look at the situation statewide and came up with some recommendations to help prevent another disaster like the Edenville one. Um, some of those major recommendations were creating a revolving loan fund to help dam owners repair their dams and mitigate the risk to surrounding communities. Hire more people for the Eagle Dam Safety Program so more inspections can be done and we can better assess the level of risk across the state because you know that isn't those aren't the only dams that we have. Allow emergency temporary drawdowns of water levels below the court order levels during periods of ever rain to prevent dam failure. Now that was an issue there. Um, that the dam owner had drawn down um, that lake level. My understanding is the state. Um, said that that was a violation because dam levels are set by the courts. And, and I'm sure that there was a lot of pushback from the, the property owners that one, they didn't want their dam level or the water level depleted. But um, again, hindsight's 2020. You know, if they had a do over, they probably would have done it. But we're trying to mitigate those circumstances in the future. Um, Increase the frequency of the inspections for high hazard dams, and then strengthen dam emergency management plans. And, um, you know, we want to ensure that we protect our residents from flooding and other hazards associated with dam failure. We also want to ensure that people can continue to enjoy the lakes that they live on and visit, because right now, at least in that area, that lake is non-existent. It's just a mess. You know, it's a it's a creek now or a river, but it's not even a nice one. Um, water is such an important issue in Michigan, and whether it's the water we drink above or or the water where we spend our recreation time, we want to ensure that um, we protect it so it's safe and available for our citizens to enjoy. And and on that same note, an, another issue that that I've been pushing that um, has um, recently taken, um, people have taken interest in again is a geological survey. So we've done good in the, you know, in the past we've done well at mapping our, our above ground services. I mean, everybody's seen topographical maps that have show the, show the terrain elevations and depressions and whatever, but we've done a poor job in this state of knowing what's underground. Um, other states have done a better job of utilizing and leveraging federal monies that come in to map underground, um, not only underground water, but underground resources, even gravel, which is, you know, as, as Representative Howell knows, is a big issue for this state. And so, um, you know, especially when we talk about potential contamination like PFAS or whatever, or even if it's a gas stations that have a leaky tank, it's nice to know which way the plume would go if, if we were having trouble. And if we map those underground resources, then we have a better ability of, of, of uh, preventing disasters or, or, or at least being able to deal with those disasters in a, a more scientific manner. And, um, and again, the, the gravel issue is, is a big one to know where those resources are so that we can we can do long-term planning for communities on, on where they should build, where they shouldn't build because gravel is a finite resource in the state, but it's certainly a necessary one. And, um, that, that's one of the things that it would help with. So um, on the DNR side, um, one of the big, thing, big things that we're working on lately would is the commercial fishing versus the sport fishing issue. And uh, I don't, did you have that in your committee at all, Representative Howell? Yes, so we had it last term and we okay. reported the bills out, which were the bills preferred by the sports fishing groups. That's and, right. And uh, went over the Senate, of course, ran into issues with commercial fishermen. So mm -hmm. this, this term, I'm hopeful that the Senate will resolve that dispute 
and then I'll be happy to take them up again. Correct. Yep. So, and, and that's an important issue, you know, for us. I mean, uh, sport fishermen, certainly we are a, a state that enjoys um, the sport of fishing. And it's, it's not only a great recreational um, sport for us, but it's also, um, you know, a, a source of income for us. And so, but it, it, it needs to be balanced with existing businesses. You know, the, these, these commercial fishermen have every right to exist and to continue to provide a service to the state and to, you know, I mean, if you go to a restaurant, you're buying fish from these commercial fishermen and, and it's, it's a, it's a viable business that, that should continue. And we just have to find a way of, of balancing those two priorities. And, and that's what we do so many times in Lansing. It's, it's not, it's never hardly an either, or it's, it's a balancing of, of competing interests. So um, I guess with that, um, I've probably spoken enough. And, <laughs> well, we will give we'll give you a chance to respond to you and, and Representative Hall a chance to respond to some of the questions. There are quite a quite a few questions. You did mention um, septic systems, and um, one of the questions is any comment about a statewide septic code. Uh, apparently, Michigan is one of a few, if not the only state without a statewide septic code. Sure. You know, I hear that a lot, and there is a big push for that. Again, coming from that industry, I'm trying to figure out, we, we do a great job in Lansing of creating rules just for the rules sake, not necessarily for any interest or, or any benefit that I can see. That, you know, what I can tell you is there's nowhere in this state that isn't governed by some type of, of, of septic regulation. You know, we do it through our, our district health departments. And, um, and some of them are regional, some of them are countywide. Um, I happen to be in one that's uh, the Mid-Michigan District Health Department. That's a, a three-county district. Immediately to my north is, is Central Michigan uh, District Health Department, which is, I, don't, I think it's five counties. To the side of me is, is uh, um, the, the one that McCost County is in. I think it's called District 10. But nevertheless, there isn't, anywhere in the state that we don't have rules governing septic systems. So I, I question the, you know, the reason why there's this big push. The only reason I say that is this state is so diverse. I can tell you, and so many things that we do, one size does not fit all. But we, we try to do that for the state. And, and usually it ends up um, hurting a lot of places that it doesn't necessarily help. I, I can tell you that my seatmate in the house was a guy named Ken Goike, who at one time was president of the Septic Association. He was from Macomb County, and he actually was a big proponent of a statewide septic code. And I asked him what his rules were down there. And of course, water tables were different, cell types were different down there, population densities were different. And when he told me his rules, I said, I can tell you, I don't want your rules up my way. And the reason I don't want that is because it's going to be an added cost to the consumers here, to the people who live here with no discernible benefit. It, it isn't going to increase the efficiency, but it's going to add a lot of regulation. And they're already cost prohibitive, and this is just going to make it worse. So I think every area does a good job of of having the rules in place. Now, if they aren't enforcing those rules, that's a different story. But, but again, putting a statewide law in isn't gonna change the enforcement mechanism of, mechanisms of a certain area. The rules are already there. They just need to enforce the rules that they have. So, so I struggle with the thought of a statewide septic company. I know there's a big push for it. They say other states have it. I can tell you where I hunt out in Nebraska. They do have a statewide health code and I can, I can, I can drop a 55 gallon drum and run a straight pipe out and, and to nowhere and it would pass out there. So, you know, when they say a statewide code, whatever that means, I don't know. If you'd like to comment on the general topic, 
Uh, last term, we did have an effort, I think Senator Ottman's referring to, uh, several bills were put in to try to get a statewide code, code and probably more importantly, some enforcement standards statewide. Uh, it didn't get anywhere, largely because there are so many interest groups. Whether you're looking at the homeowners, the realtors, the health departments, so on and so forth. It was very hard to get the stakeholders in any kind of agreement on something that was reasonable. Uh, I'm not necessarily advocate of a statewide code. Maybe there could be some minimal standards that would apply statewide, but Senator Rao makes a good point that our geology in Michigan is vastly different across the state. And it's probably gonna be hard to have a code that really makes sense everywhere. We've got a pretty stringent code here in Lapeer County and they do a pretty decent job of initially enforcing it when you install your system. The breakdown I think that's affecting the lakes and we've got a number of lakes in Lapeer County is we've got so many older lots, quite small. They got some kind of system put in back in the 40s or 50s that will meet any kind of code now but there really is no system short of somebody spotting sewage coming off the property and complaints file. There's really no system to monitor those. And I think that's gonna be the big challenge because you gotta balance the health and safety and sanitation against the pragmatic effect of, can the folks involved afford a brand new system? And I think maybe that's where the Outman bill was referred to would be of some assistance if we had a loan program that would facilitate it. But to go to some elderly pensioner and say, you got to spend 15 or 20,000 to put an elevated system, probably isn't going to happen as a practical matter. So we got to find a middle ground somehow to have reasonable enforcement and then some way to pay for it. I think it'll come up again, but right now there are no bills in my committee that are attempting to do that again. Okay, it's an important topic. Thank you both for giving, giving us your views. I'm trying to go through the uh, questions here, see if I can combine some. Here's something uh, that is not just germane to Michigan. Uh, it says, we live in a shallow inland lake. We are concerned about wake boats. Uh, their waves are erosive on our shoreline. Their ballast tanks can carry aquatic invasive species. Uh, the slipstream mixes sediment on the lake bottom, reintroducing nutrients to the water, feeding aquatic vegetation. Is the legislature considering any wake boat regulations? And I want to preface that by saying that, that MLSA is, is quite involved in this topic. We were a major funder for a study that's going on right now through the University of Minnesota at the St. Anthony Falls lab. So um, we're looking to see what the science shows us uh, before any potential activity. But I don't know if you folks have an, if you ever heard of them, uh, if, if you have an opinion, but uh, several of the commenters here are concerned with the impact of these boats that can make a three or four foot wave uh, above the surface and maybe even larger one below the surface, what impact it has on other users or our fisheries. So, I'll make a comment because it's going to be brief. I didn't even know such a thing existed until Dave Maturin told me a few days ago. Uh, we don't live in a lake, we have a farm pond, and uh, so it's not an issue locally. Nobody's brought it to my attention until Dave mentioned it. Uh, but obviously you need to have some objective facts, whatever you're gonna do. So the research has to be done. You can have anecdotes as to whether they're good, bad, or indifferent, but the legislature is gonna wanna see some evidence if there's gonna be support for regulation would be my guess. But that's the beginning and the end of my knowledge of this issue. <laughs> Maybe Rick's had some experience with it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what a wake boat is, but I know that last year, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Representative Powell, but um, that we, we introduced legislation because we had the high inland lake levels. Uh, we did have legislation that we put in place that there are certain parameters um, of lake levels, when they exceed these parameters, then there are times when, when you can't create wakes on these, on these lakes, um, other than maybe we did allow for um, some holiday weekends or something, but I can't remember yeah. the exact specifics yes, you're, of them. Yeah, you're on the right track. We had bills from Representative Lilly and Representative Eisen trying to deal with that. Uh, of course, Representative Lilly is on the Lake Michigan side, so he was looking at high water there. Representative Eisen represents St. Clair County, 
and uh, they have some extremely low-lying lands near where Ken Gokey represent, represented, uh, Parsons Island and Clay Township and those areas where if you went down there last year, the water level was almost synonymous with the land level. So they had vast problems. So they did put into effect what you're talking about, a procedure uh, that they could go through to have some weight control. Now that was dealing with natural water levels. I don't know if that would apply to a wake boat situation where the water level might not be the issue, it's the right. weight caused by the boat. Uh, but at least I think there'd be some interest if we can get some objective facts. Right. Yeah, I think you're, you're, you're right about the, about the uh, eyes and lily bills. We were uh, supportive of those bills and, and they, they, they helped for that particular aspect of it. Most people on the lake realize that you don't do that when the water's high, create big waves to wreck everybody's boats and shorelines, everything else. But there's always a couple people out there that that's why we have the law. Um, so anyway, I appreciate you at least being aware of that. And, and, and uh, at least now you know that it's a topic of, of great uh, discussion amongst lots of, uh, lots of lake owners. Um, quick question on zero interest loans. Is there a site where people could find out about those and is it only applicable to a primary residence and not a secondary residence like a lake home? So I think so far there isn't because the, the legislation just got passed. Okay. But the way it's going to be set up is it's going to be, it's going to be prioritized. So it'll be somewhat need-based, you know, um, but it's also going to be on level of priority to ecological value. So if, if it's a septic that's on a, on a waterway or something, it would take a higher, higher priority than, you know, if you were in the middle of a 40 acre field and your septic failed, it may not score as high in order to access that money. Um, okay. I would guess that if it's a second home, it probably wouldn't score very high because again, need-based, your, your primary residence would be a lot more need-based than a secondary yeah. residence. But, a, but again, if, if that secondary residence is on a home or on a lake, then it may bump it up too. I'm not, it's, it's, this is in the infancy stage, okay. but it's, it's something we're working on. Is that a DNR program or an Eagle program? Do you know? It'll be a, an Eagle program. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we, people can contact the department if they want yes. further information on that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. We had a question. Speaking of Eagle, uh, there's uh, right now there's uh, we've, we've heard earlier today and from some other people that the uh, Eagle and, and DNR folks are on a 90 day uh, budget schedule, not an annual budget. Do you have any thoughts on that at all? I know Representative Hall's not on appropriations. I don't know if that's just a house thing or if it's something the Senate's looking at, but oh. I'm just wondering, is, is that a realistic way to, to run our environmental laws and rules and regulations? Thanks. Probably not. Uh, now, I believe it's only the House that's looking at that. I don't believe the Senate is. No, no. Senator Outman can address that. The House is looking at it. I think it makes zero sense for the DR. Obviously, there's a bigger issue here, which is accountability on the part of the governor or the administration for other types of spending. I don't know of any rationale, and I would not support a 90-day segmented budget for DNR. I might be open to it for some of the issues relating to the pandemic and some of the regulations and things like that. But that's a political fight uh, that should not involve the DNR, in my personal opinion. Yeah, and, and that is something we're not looking at. Um, you know, we, we will come to an agreement with the House when, when we go into conference committee, but um, it certainly, it's, it, it didn't start here. and. Uh, I don't know that I would support it either. I can I can tell you, being chair of the DHHS sub approve subcommittee, I am not in favor of going through this every three months. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for your insights on that. Um, here's a question. Um, obviously, we have a lot of public access sites, um, and and there's there's a concern. Is there? And, but not every one of them. Most of them don't have any kind of a boat wash station uh, to, to prevent control aquatic invasive species. So are there any talks about having a recreation fee to help pay for boat wash stations 
to prevent in, uh, aquatic invasive species. Um, some, you know, some some places do that routinely, but they they're pretty costly. But yet, folks like me that live on a lake, you know, um, other people use the lake, and they're probably the ones. I, I I have my boat there. It never it never goes from Indian Lake. It just gets put in and gets taken out to storage. But there's lots of other people who use multiple lakes, you know, in, in our county or in fact in, in Indiana or wherever that come up and drop their boat in. How do we how do we prevent that spread when we don't necessarily put it all in the backs of the homeowners there, but maybe the people that are causing the problems? Um, recreation fees was one thought that this particular questioner had. Any thoughts? Or? Well, like I say, I'm not an appropriation, so I'm and I'm not aware of that discussion. I'd be open to taking a look at it. Uh, actually, we got a much broader issue, and I realize. The, Invasive species are of your immediate concern and mine too, but there are much broader issues here, which have to do with the fact that the hunters and fishers of Michigan pay the vast amount of the money that supports a lot of these programs. Yeah. Many people are essentially free riders, the ones that hike through the forest, the ones that do a hundred bird watching, you name it, a thousand other activities, all legitimate, but they're not contributing anything to any of the costs. So, kayaks and canoes or another ones. I don't know the answer, but I think we're ultimately gonna to have, to have to come up with some system where everybody pays a fair share. Uh, I'd be open to what you're talking about, Dave, but I'm not aware of a proposal. Maybe Senator Altman is, but I'm not aware of anything in the house or from the DNR. Yeah, I haven't heard of anything in the Senate. Um, this is the first time I've heard of the issue. I, I certainly understand the issue. Um, my brother-in-law um, sells pontoons and bass boats. Well, now all over the nation because of the internet, but um, particularly in this area. And he also takes them out and puts them back in in the spring for people, winterizes them. And so I help sometimes. And, and, and you know the lakes that have like the zebra mussel problems and, and all yeah. that. I mean, you, you can definitely see it. And uh, So again, aware of the problem, just not aware of any legislation dealing with it at this point. Okay, I'm trying to find some different topics and if we have time, we can maybe circle back. Uh, one of them uh, says, can you address efforts to stop algae blooms? Um, anything that you know of, any, any legislation, anything from the departments uh, dealing with how to stop algae blooms that do occur quite frequently in our lakes, sometimes rivers? Well, some of that, of course, goes back to Senator Outman's comments earlier as what's the source of these things. Uh, and a lot of it, again, relates back some to agriculture, but a lot of it to inadequate septic systems or inadequate sewage treatment operations that are getting into the lake. So it's, you know, it's relatively easy to regulate a traditional polluter. If you've got a factory and they're spewing gunk into the river, you can find the pipe, you can take action, you can get an injunction. When you've got thousands of people that may have some small part in it collectively, it's a much more challenging effort. And of course, as many people may know, there are specific efforts going on as to the Lake Erie area and the Saginaw Bay area, where we're trying to work with landowners. Uh, I'm in the Saginaw Bay area here, although fairly distant from the Bay. But so that's an effort, collective effort, try to find ways to reduce the agricultural runoff as well as deal with these septic systems. But it's, it's a real challenge because it's not a matter of just passing a rule and saying, bingo, it's solved. You're gonna to have to find a way to, uh, to contain all of this material to have an impact on the algae flows. And, and we've done a lot of that, even in, in my former life as an excavator, um, when we're when we're cleaning county drains or or doing any kind of farm work, where you know there's a big push to plant filter strips along the edge of any flowing water or around any lake, so that you don't have agricultural runoff, which as you're as you're farming it, and um, you know people people are starting to see the value in those things, and 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 they've been good at allowing these farmers to 
not necessarily not farm next to these, but farm differently. You know, instead of having something that you have to till up every year, plant hay or something where, where all you're doing is cutting it and, and you're leaving it over time. And um, so th things are happening. I mean, it, it's getting cleaner and cleaner, but we've got a long ways to go. But, um, and again, as Representative Howell said, it's, uh, you know, we, we've got to clean up these, these wastewater treatment, you know, the, the storm waters, the wastewater, the individual septic systems, um, they're certainly contributing to that. And, and we, there's a renewed push for that. And hopefully with the governor's Clean Waters Initiative Act and, and, and some of the legislation that we're, we're proposing, um, it'll help mitigate a lot of those circumstances. Okay. Uh, here's a question. Um, what, what is the state of Michigan doing to support transition to renewable energy production and move away from coal and the subsequent need to dispose of the toxic coal ash? Are there initiatives from the legislative side, from the administrative side uh, to move more, towards more uh, renewable energy production? Actually, the initiatives are coming directly from the public utilities. Both Detroit Edison and Consumers Power have made major commitments to phase out coal and to phase in other sources of energy. So I'm not sure the state needs to do anything. I mean, they're on a what I think is a really expedited schedule to get that done because it's not a simple issue. You know, you need reliability of energy. It's fine to move to clean energy to some degree, but we've got to make sure that we provide, we don't want to be Texas. We don't want to have blackouts. We don't want to have our people not having uh, electricity. So you're going to have to accommodate, perhaps coal definitely on its way out, but you have to accommodate natural gas and other practical ways to fill in because the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. And uh, I can tell you from my area in the thumb, there are mixed environmental concerns. Granted, we don't want air pollution, but frankly, many of us are not thrilled with having hundreds of hundreds of windmills lighting our landscape. And when I look, I don't want to look out my farm window and see 27 windmills on the horizon. We got a lot of them in the upper thumb and it's caused a huge blowback. You know, it's nice to sit in Birmingham and say, I'd like to use clear energy, but they don't have the ones that have these windmills imposed on them. So if there's a real balancing act here, I think you're going to find it's going to be a long transition. Now, obviously, the federal administration is taking an extremely aggressive attitude on this. And uh, not being totally partisan, but I am a Republican. And they are spending vast, vast, ridiculous amounts of money that we don't have on this and many other programs. So it's going to take some intelligent planning. But I have faith that the public utilities are going to move in this direction because of natural market forces. Uh, we've also got some bills in that are interesting. I don't know if they're going to pass or not, providing for community solar or community wind, where you wouldn't even be relying necessarily on the public utility, where you might form a local co-op, in essence, to provide that yourself in a smaller scale. You know, that's an issue that, that I've been involved with since I, I was a state representative, because when I first took over Gratiot County or the portion of Gratiot that I had as a representative, that's when the wind farms were just first coming online in, in Gratiot. You know, I was very skeptical of wind energy then because of the reliability factor. You know, the, the first wind farms were in the thumb area. And back then with the technology that they had then, even with the, the vast amount of wind resource that they had there compared to the other parts of the state, the reliability factor was only 30%, meaning that there wasn't enough wind to generate electricity 70% of the time, which speaks to what Representative Howell said, you have to have a dispatchable source then, because we are a, we are a industrialized nation that is used to the fact that when I flip a switch, my lights go on in my house. And we're not a third world country that, that is going to tolerate rolling blackouts or rolling brownouts. And, and you can't store wind energy. When we have the technology available that we can, it's gonna be a game changer, but right now we don't. And so 
you generate it, you put it on the grid, and when it's gone, it's gone. And now we do have a great storage. We do have a, a great battery in the state of Michigan right now, which is the Ludington, um, what is that called? Pumped storage plant. Yeah, it's, it's where they pump up water during the day um, or, or at night, I guess, when, when rates and, and demand are low. And then they release that stored potential energy um, to create electricity during the day when, when demand is high and, and rates are higher to help offset that. And so it is, I mean, Representative Howell's right, the, the industry is transitioning itself, but you're right, the, the, the windmill, looking out your window and looking at wind turbines, um, that's, that's just starting to hit my county, Montcalm County. And I can tell you that it's, it's dividing this county. It is a very hot potato issue. And it's not even one that people can talk rationally about. You are either, you either love it or you hate it. And there's no middle ground. And, but I talked to consumers the other day about that. And one of our local consumers people, and, and what she said is consumers is actually transitioning now out of wind, not, tr not transitioning out of it, but they think that they've got enough wind capacity within their portfolio that they're starting to transition into um, uh, solar for the rest of their renewal, renewable energy portfolio. Again, there's a drawback to that. But the plus is you don't see these giant wind turbines out your window. But wind turbines only take a small portion of a field that you can farm around. You can do a lot of things around. You can hunt around. When you talk about solar energy, you're talking about a bigger, a bigger footprint. You know, you're talking about 40, 50, a couple hundred acres out of, particularly when you talk about, we used to deal with urban sprawl years ago and the detrimental effect that was having on the agricultural industry. When you start putting in these um, solar farms, you're going to take a lot of agricultural property out of, out of rotation and for a long period of time. And so there's a drawback to it also. But, but again, I guess the technology is improving enough in solar energy where it's becoming a viable um, source of energy. So. Senator yes, Robin makes some very good points. There's no such thing as a free lunch. You know, you can have more wind energy, but you got a lot of controversy. You can have more solar energy, but you got the ag effect, other things. I don't know what the ultimate answer is. But I would, those that want this stuff, I wish they would share the burden. Uh, we're getting it all over the thumb. And I met with Detroit Edison recently, much as Senator Outman did with consumers. Edison has taken the same track. They are tired of being in these endless political fights with the communities where some want it very badly and some hate it. Uh, they found that solar is, while not uniformly popular, less controversial. Uh, and we've got some coming in the thumb area that don't seem to engender the same level of opposition, I think, because it's not in your face. Uh, you can have the uh, solar just over the next hill and you wouldn't even know it's there unless you go drive by it. Whereas with these wind towers with the red lights on top, you see them 24 hours a day. So I realize that's not an energy aspect, but it's a practical thing. Uh, like Senator Upman says, I've seen civil wars over this thing. I mean, friends and neighbors and relatives despise each other because of their opposite side. So uh, it's a real challenge as to how we're gonna handle all this. And then you can always throw out, well, the best place to put us out in the middle of the lake, make it offshore. But if you wanna have a real fight going on, propose offshore windmills. So for those of us that love the lakes, you wanna think about it, it's the same thing when you stick one of those things next to somebody's farmhouse. So uh, if anybody's got the magic bullet on this one, I'm all ears, because it's gonna be a controversy going on for decades, I suspect. Yeah, thanks Thanks for your, your insight on that. It, it, it's never easy. Um, they, they are getting better as far as, you know, getting more of the up to capacity as far as the energy goes and the turbines are getting bigger, which then creates, creates, uh, creates a little bit of a problem because now they're more visible to some folks. I know quite a few of the units of government up in the thumb will pass ordinances against uh, wind turbine generators. Um, if we get battery storage someday, that would be a, a, a really 
a great thing for them because right now you're right. It just goes out in the grid and there it goes. There's no way of containing it. And again, uh, cloudy days, uh, dog days, of August, your renewables don't perform like, like the like typical uh, on-demand generating system would be with, uh, well, not coal anymore. They're getting rid of those, but even, you know, natural gas or nuclear, which some people still think is, is possibly a, a good addition to the mix. Um, but certainly, uh, yeah, you love them, hate them. You probably like them if you've got a couple on your, on your farm and you're getting rent. It's pretty nice uh, royalties and rent. But if you live next door to it and you're not getting anything, uh, and then you got the shadow of it, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, those are the kind of issues that uh, you folks get to, get to deal with and solve. So, yeah, happy, happy to have you folks with your wisdom. Uh, sitting there in Lansing. I think we had a, I'm told there's a hand up. Is there a Lon Nordine? Did you have a, a hand up at all, Lon? If so. I saw that he was unmuted. I thought maybe he had something to say, but it looks like he quickly muted himself. So I okay. don't think he realized okay. well, that, that was what was going no, on. No, I, I actually did have a question. Just oh, in, good. Thank you for all this discussion. I wondered about, um, wondered about the land use element. You, you guys both brought it up, all three of you brought it up, but how do we find a good solution? Because certainly the point you brought up about putting solar units on the edge of the lake or uh, wind farms in the water, have you got feedback from your uh, constituents about that? Because I know they do offshore in the ocean, but I mean, that steals away land or water use in the lakes. And I, I can imagine that would be rather controversial. Yes. To put it mildly. <laughs> well, dangerous too, because how many people can drive into the, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You're supposed to have your eyes open when you're driving your boat. Though, I think, so. <laughs> Maybe not, thought that was in the rules. Dave, Dave yeah. could I make a, we don't have a question currently, if I could make a comment that I wanted to, follow up briefly on one of Senator Altman's points, which was very important. Sure. Uh, you did send us this Water Use Advisory Council document, which is quite extensive. And honestly, I haven't read the entire thing, but I did glance through it. And I noticed there was a proposal to make additional work with the geologic survey. Uh, they're talking here about water issues, obviously, but if there's one single thing that I would advocate for, whether it's water use, land use, gravel, like Rick mentioned, landfill issues. We don't know nearly enough about how it's underground in Michigan. It would be an incredibly wise investment for the state to get this geologic survey work done so we knew more about our aquifers, we knew more about the effect of water pumping, we knew more about where are the aggregate resources, for instance, or the sand resources, or where is a totally lousy place to put a landfill compared to one that is feasible. We're all shooting in the dark on a lot of these really major issues. So I would love to see an alliance with a lot of folks that are concerned about conservation, natural resource issues, that we get objective information. Because Senator Atman and I struggle all the time, with how do you strike a reasonable balance? And we honestly don't know, to take the aggregate as an example, uh, we honestly don't know where all the aggregate deposits are, where the best deposits are, where the most feasible ones for transport are. We don't know what the aquifers are that are affecting a lot of these pollution issues. If there's one investment I would advocate, it would be doing a lot more with the geologic survey. So I'm really happy the Water Use Advisory Council made that a major point in their report. And, and you can bet that the aggregate industry, many of them know where the gravel deposits are. Um, you know, they're, they want to know where they're at, particularly if they want to buy a piece of property, and they want to know whether it's worth buying or not. But it's about like your favorite mushrooming spot. Go ask somebody where it's at. They're not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it has to be in the public domain. <laughs> right. All right, Dave, I don't know if you see, but we do have a hand up. We have um, Lisa yeah. Adams from Big Bass Lake. Hi, um, I uh, commend you gentlemen for showing up here today um, to interact with a bunch of riparians who are all uh, very passionate about the waters in Michigan. I happen to be one of them. 
Um, I don't have a question for you. I just wanted to give you a little insight into what is happening um, to riparians on Big Bass and Little Bass Lakes, as well as other lakes. Um, <clears throat> we recently just created a 501c3 organization um, for our lakes. And the main reason for taking this approach versus just keeping a lake association is it gives us the ability to apply for grants and to solicit donations to pay for the huge expense of controlling aquatic invasive species in our lake. We currently have a SAD in place. And um, over the past 11 years, that SAD has raised $350,000 for putting herbicide in our lake to control um, aquatic invasive species. Um, there is no way to eradicate these species. Um, and there's really no solution in sight. So what we're faced with is continuing every year to putting you know, over $30,000 of chemicals in our lake just so it doesn't get any worse. So when you hear someone say, um, can we use uh, you know, some of the recreation fees to buy boat washing stations to put at boat launches, especially DNR boat launches, um, I think that this is something that you would like to consider because it does have a very definite economic impact on riparians. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. well, thanks for that comment. And that's certainly something that I'm sure Representative Howell and myself will, will um, start the discussion on because I, I can see the logic in it. And uh, it's, it's the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And if we can prevent, you know, and we do it all the time, we used to do it in the military when we were overseas and then we had to bring our equipment back. Part of the process was stop somewhere and, and we called it desnelling it because we didn't want to bring those foreign invasive whatever back to the United States. So I agree. Yeah, but I would suggest, because obviously you've got a fairly active uh, lake association, get in touch with your local legislators, your state representative, your state senator. You need some advocates. You need... I mean, it's fine that Senator Outman and I are now aware of this issue and would be perhaps supportive, but you need advocates, people that represent the lake areas. They're going to come forth and say, look, I'm here for my constituents. We've got these problems. Here's a solution we'd like to look at and get a bill in. Uh, that's what it takes, some, and it needs to be more than one. You've got the advantage of having a statewide organization, so you've obviously got constituents in many legislative districts, so it's a piece of practical political advice, I would motivate your local legislator to become aware of the problem and then throw out the solution. Uh, this whole thing is just an incredible dilemma. While I don't live on a lake, we have a sizable farm pond. I spend a fair amount of money just keeping that pond in decent shape. I've had Phragmites to fight in there. I've had a, a number of invasive species that you have to go to war with and spend money on. So uh, we need a we need a more comprehensive approach, really. And, and Rep Howell, spot on there. There's strength in numbers. The more representatives and senators are aware of the issue, the easier it is to craft legislation and get it through in order to deal with any particular issue. Now, I, I've tried to to tell folks when they're in, you know when they got issues. You know, I think most of you. Most of you folks have, you know, if you don't have a cell phone, you got a toll-free number. I think most of the, most of the, a lot of the uh, uh, offices do. I know mine used to. Uh, you, you know, you hold coffees, you meet with different groups around your districts. Um, but I, I've tried to tell folks if, if you got an issue, don't get the entire legislature's email and send something out because most people, if it's not your district, and I did the same thing. If I got stuff from people in my district. Those are the folks that got the call back on the way home at night. You know, and the other stuff would just mount up. Now they're, you know, I mean, I had certain certain personal interests that I might take a look at, but you know, with all the people you've got, probably ninety thousand as a state rep and three hundred thousand as a state senator, um, you know, you got those folks to really concentrate on. So um, I would suggest writing your own representative and your own senator, or again, finding out when they've got a local meeting with whatever group it might be, or, or again, coffees or whatever folks hold. Do, do you have any advice for people on 
how to contact their rep and senator? Is it an email better? Is a phone call better? Is you know what's what is what's a method that's going to get their point across without being so repetitive that somebody just automatically takes and puts it in the in the in the do not read file or whatever it might be. Well, one thing I would not do is don't send us 500 copies of the exact same email. We get these email blasts from everybody and his brother in California and Detroit and wherever else. As Dave has said, we pay attention to our constituents. That is our primary job, to worry about our district and our people. So it needs to come from my constituent. And obviously, if it's somebody I either have met, have a connection with, or best of all, comes to a coffee hour and talks to me face to face. I mean, I don't hide. I'm here on the farm. My name's on the barn. I've got an office in Lapeer. There's a hundred ways to get a hold of me. And if somebody has that issue locally in Lapeer County, say at Lake Nepissing, which is our biggest lake, they'll get my attention by talking to me or calling me. Um, but repetitive emails are worse than useless, in my opinion. I get them all the time. I'm sure the senator gets them all the time. You can't deal with 500 emails. And when you see there are the exact same wording, you know, all this person has done is hit the send button. They haven't really committed themselves to studying the issue and communicating with us. That's the most effective way. Yeah. And, and so for my office, email, call, either one, you'll get a response. Um, but certainly like Rep Howell said, I, I hold coffee hours throughout my district and, and everybody's more than, um, more than welcome to come to those. And, uh, and that's a great way to, for me to put a face to a voice or face to an email. And, uh, but any of those methods is fine, but, but he's right. Chain emails, they don't do it. They're just, <laughs> there's no effort on, on their part. And they're just, you, when, when we get those, we get them from everywhere in the United States and you're just lost in the shuffle. Okay. We're just, I think just about out of time. Um, I don't, see anything that really hasn't been discussed. Uh, we've got a lot of a lot of comments and topics and we'll take a look at those after the uh, session's over, after after things kind of calm down. I, I, don't, I know Melissa's looking for the end of the day. She's been just uh, uh, wearing herself ragged. So trying to trying to put all this together is quite, quite a feat. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at the question of something else that we need to follow up, either we can follow up or, or maybe get with you folks and ask for clarification or something like that. But certainly appreciate you, your, your attending. It's, it's important for people to put a name on the face and see the people that are effectively gonna make the rules and regulations we live under. Uh, but it's nice to see folks that are, that are involved in the issues, cognizant of what's going on. And uh, I, I knew you two guys would be good because I serve with you and they know what kind of, what kind of legislators you were. So uh, I, I certainly really appreciate it, hopefully the <clears throat> the uh, hundreds of folks that have attended this uh, certainly appreciate the uh, information you've gotten to kind of give us a better insight as to how things in Lansing work. So, Melissa, if you want to take it from here. And... Yes, I just want to echo that. Thank you both so much for coming and speaking with us. We really appreciate your time and um, your comments. I, I think based on the uh, chat, they were very, um, very much appreciated. So um, that brings us to the end of our keynote. And as I've said in other sessions before, if you are interested in showing your appreciation, you can use your reaction buttons and you can clap or give them a thumbs up. Um, it's a, a good way to do that in this, in this format. Um, I, I went ahead and put the conference agenda back in the chat and um, you know, just for your reference, you can take a look. Uh, we're going to get started again at 1.30. Um, we have two possible sessions for you. We have a session um, with Ralph Bednars. Um, he's retired DEQ. He will be uh, talking about the volunteer monitoring on Michigan lakes and streams, the self-help CLMP MyCore legacy. Um, so that should be a really interesting session um, and the history of those programs. And we also have uh, a session called SAD Talk, Special Assessment Districts in Washtenaw County. Um, and we have a, uh, a group of uh, specialists from Washtenaw County who will be speaking about that. 
Um, so we look forward to seeing you at the next session at 1.30. And thank you again to the representative and the senator for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Yeah.